This episode is supported by FX's Grotesquerie, a new series from executive producer Ryan Murphy. Heinous crimes unsettle a small community, and the local detective feels these atrocities are eerily personal, as if someone or something is taunting her. Starring Nisi Nash Betts, Courtney B. Vance, Leslie Manville, and Travis Kelsey. FX's Grotesquerie premieres September 25th on FX. Stream on Hulu. It's time for Tuesday Terror here on the Mutual Audio Network. Be sure to leave the lights on while you listen. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. You're listening to Audio Theater in a Darker Shade. This is DarkerProject.com. And now our feature presentation. The following audio is explicit in nature and may contain adult themes, light sexual situations, violent content, or strong language. Time when the end of the world was just the beginning of a nightmare. When the worst of us set the world to burn while the best of us cower in terror. Tonight's presentation, Madness, Episode 3, House of the Devil, written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. Previously on Madness. Like hell. I need to get to the gas station. I had a signal there. I need to call Melissa. <laughs> you were all like, ah! <laughs> and Chris was just like, bang, you're dead. <laughs> yep, that's pretty much what happened. Chris, I have to know that <laughs> Melissa's okay. Oh, no, no. My truck. What is that? I don't know. Some fucking metal pipe. God damn it. It went right through the engine block. Jared, you make it? You... You killed him. Yeah. He was trying to kill us. And now I got us a car and a shotgun. You're welcome. Ronnie, uh, you have Facebook on your phone? Duh. Check it out. See if anyone's saying anything. Everyone's just posting crazy stuff. Someone help. I think my dad's trying to kill me. Oh, God. What the fuck is happening? Lol. Someone just flew a plane at a Big Ben. LMAO. What? Wait, Big Ben? What else has she been posting? Nothing good. Just a selfie. Let me see. Oh, God. It's happening everywhere. There's no shoulder. Hang on. I'm putting it in reverse. Faster! He's still coming! It doesn't go any faster in reverse. Shit! Shit! Getting back to town. Yeah, sure. This is all a conspiracy against you. Oh, my head. Wait, wait, what are you doing? Take it easy. I'm gonna take a look. He's still out there. 
Wait, wait, Chris! <sighs> Ronnie, wait! <gasps> okay, he's dead. You can come out now. The wreckage of a four-wheeler was crumpled into the grill of the car. The body of a teenage boy, maybe 15 years old, hung at an awkward angle. One of his legs crushed and twisted into the wreck. His head was still bleeding from two fresh bullet holes. At least my aim is getting better. Yeah, good for you. A fish in a barrel. How about you start running and give me a moving target, cashier? Wait a second. Chris, how many bullets do you have left? I don't know. Like two. Damn it. You didn't bring any extras? Well, I'm sorry, Jared. On any other day, ten rounds is pretty much all you need. I know, but... Jesus Christ, are you sure you only have two? <sighs> there, see? One in the clip, one in the chamber. Shit. What about your shotgun? How many shells does it have? Oh, right. It's, um... It's in the car. Well, it has one in the barrel. So, one shot, I guess. Christ, Jared. Give it to me. It's a four cartridge. Do you even know how to use a shotgun? Yeah, sure. You just aim and, and pull the trigger, right? That button by your thumb is a trigger lock. Trigger lock? That's the safety, man. Come on. Oh, right. And you'll have to pump it before each shot to load the next cartridge. And you said I have four shots? I said it could hold four cartridges, but the hillbilly tried to shoot us, so you have three. Okay, so that means the safety's off then, right? Is the button red? Uh, no. Then it's ready to fire. Just make sure to hold it tight against your shoulder, or it's going to bruise the shit out of you. Do you think there's more rounds in the... Wait, where's Ronnie? Fuck if I know. Look, there's a farmhouse. Do you think he's... Going to get his ass killed? Yeah, I do. Come on, maybe they have a car. Trees loomed to our left. A long line of windbreakers meant to help shield the crops in the field on the other side. I kept the barrel of my shotgun trained on the shadows they cast between them, waiting for some savage psychopath to charge out of the darkness. To our right was cow pasture, where a herd of bovines crowded together to fend off the mid-October chill. My mind wandered for a moment to the cows, peaceful and docile, secure in the knowledge that there was safety in numbers, and I was suddenly and enormously grateful for Chris's presence. Hey, Chris. Huh? I'm... I'm sorry about about what I said. I know that you saved my ass more than once. Thank you. Yeah, well, just remember that when it's my ass on the line. I will. I just wanted to... Shit! Look out! A deer bounded out of the trees and across the road ten yards in front of us. It was halfway across the pasture before I realized what it was. Before I realized I had stumbled over myself in fright and fallen on my ass. Raising the shotgun had never even occurred to me, and I silently thanked God that it wasn't something more dangerous. <laughs> yeah, Jared Carvey, my fucking hero. Well... The lights are on, at least. Do you think he went inside? Yeah, look. There's one of those nasty menthols he was smoking crushed out on the step. Do you think there's people in there? Unless you think the teenager on the four-wheeler was the man of the house. Then I'd say probably. Okay. So, what should we do? We go in and shoot anything that isn't Ronnie. And then maybe we shoot that little dickhead, too. Shit. It's a big house. Do you think we have enough bullets? I don't know. A mom, a dad, maybe a grandpa. Six or seven no birth controlled allowed Catholic farm kids. I'm serious. We only have five shots between us, and I doubt I can hit anything. 
And you're not exactly the world's greatest marksman. Yeah, you're right. Maybe we should just stand here in the open arguing about it until Farmer John snipes us from his bedroom window. Okay, point taken. Care to lead the way? Well, I... I mean, I'm... <laughs> Take it easy, Trigger. You really think I'd send you in first? I mean, there could be deer in there. The scent of death from inside the farmhouse immediately overtook us as Chris stepped into the small foyer. It only took a moment to see the source. A woman in a flowing nightgown laid on the hardwood floor in the living room, freshly murdered and face down in a pool of blood. Chunks of her flesh were missing, as if something had been eating her. I had to suppress a scream as we crossed the living area toward the kitchen, and the smell brought bile up from my stomach. Chris had merely glanced at the corpse, decided it posed no threat, and didn't give it a second thought. The kitchen was large and well-equipped, featuring not only a massive side-by-side -side refrigerator, but a large, upright, deep freeze. The floor was strewn with the latter's contents, frozen meats and various microwavable products. Even the glass shelves had been tossed away indifferently. Streaks of blood traveled across the floor, ending at the freezer, which bore a dozen or more tiny, bloody handprints. I knew what Chris would find when he opened it, and I steeled myself against the gore that was coming. Huh. Leftovers. Oh! Christ, I'm gonna be sick. <coughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, it's coming from upstairs. Do you think it's Ronnie? Well, why don't you take your shotgun and go check it out? I... I... Fine. Get out of my way, then. Chris pushed past me into the living room, where the staircase stood along one wall. He casually ascended the steps and disappeared into the hallway beyond the railing that looked down from the second floor. I froze again, exposed in the open living room. Chris came back into view at the railing above and turned to fire again. But before I could process what I was seeing, the wooden railing gave way in an explosion of polished rosewood and Chris fell in a heap to the floor. I stumbled back, narrowly avoiding Chris's falling body. Blood trickled from around his head and I looked up to see his assailant. Standing on the second story landing was a young girl, maybe nine or ten years old. She was the image of shattered innocence, crouched like a lioness ready to pounce, fingers splayed as if brandishing claws and teeth bared in an angry grin. Her hair and white nightgown was matted and stained with fresh blood, which also tinged her teeth and chin bright crimson. For a long moment, we stood there, staring at each other. Her, a cold and calculating predator, and me, a timid rabbit, frozen in the gaze of the wolf. She let out a piercing scream without warning, and I stumbled back again, tripping over the body of the woman on the living room floor. Then, I raised the shotgun. The gun kicked hard against my shoulder. But as I fired, the girl leaped from her perch. There was a sickening crack as one of her ankles shattered from the fall. As my panic-stricken mind fumbled for a next move, the girl rose up. Her left foot angled inward at a macabre angle, popping and crunching as she continued to limp toward me, one hand grasping the air in front of her. Blinded by terror and forgetting the shotgun in my hands, I found myself almost instantly at the top of the stairs with the girl struggling to navigate the steps behind me. I sprinted down the narrow hallway and ducked into the last door, slamming it hard after I passed. This was unmistakably the girl's bedroom. Decked out in various shades of pinks and purples, posters of young heartthrobs and Disney princesses plastered on the walls, and a collection of plush animals and plastic dolls strewn about. And there, in the middle of her floor... Oh no! Ronnie! He was just a kid. He was just a kid trying to get home. Seeing him there, blood pooling around him and his stomach open like a gutted pig. Christ! I went numb, feeling nothing but loss for the young man I didn't even know. I knelt beside him and tears flooded my eyes. I'm sorry. God, I am so dead. <laughs>
Sorry. I spun around on my knees. The girl crouched on all fours in the hall, murderous, mindless rage flickering in her eyes, and I lifted the gun to fire. Shit! Even crippled by her broken ankle, the girl was on top of me before I could line up a shot. She was strong, stronger than a petite preteen girl had any right to be. But the adrenaline pumping through my veins gave me the strength to twist the barrel of the shotgun at her. I awoke in a frantic daze. An explosion of pain tore through my skull, and dried blood caked the side of my head. My foggy mind harkened back to the zombie movies I watched as a kid. Oh, God. Had she bitten me? Was I going to become... No. No. It was the recoil. The gun leaped out of my one-handed grasp and must have sent the stock plowing into my head with enough force to knock me out cold. The girl lay a few feet away. Still and lifeless on the carpeted floor, the top of her head, her face. I struggled to get on my feet, my head careening into a spin and sending fresh throbs of blinding white-hot pain through my injured brain. The room was bathed in morning light, which did nothing to help my rapidly worsening headache. I tossed my bleary eyes around, letting them rest for a long moment on Ronnie's bloating body. The shotgun was nowhere to be found. I stumbled out of the room and down the hall, coming to the ruins of the rosewood banister where Chris had fallen. I looked down and felt a sense of vertigo that threatened to push me off the landing, but Chris wasn't there. I cautiously made my way down the stairs and rounded the corner into the kitchen. I'll be damned. He sat casually at the kitchen table, eating a bowl of cereal. Coldly unconcerned with the mangled corpse of Farmer John that still hung out of the freezer. I was sure you were dead. What happened? I don't know. I just woke up with a massive headache. I think I hit my head. I thought I'd have some breakfast and plan my next move. Would you please sit the fuck down? I hate it when people stand around watching me eat. <sighs> You want some? No. Fine. But if you pass out from malnourishment, I'm leaving your ass behind. How long were we out? Three hours, I guess. Sun was just coming up, so I hiked down to the car and found some more shells for the shotgun. It's on the counter, beside the fridge. You can have it if you want. Yeah. Jared. What? You think I'm crazy, too, don't you? I... no. I, I didn't say... It's okay. I'm not entirely sure that you're wrong. I mean, I killed Steve, Kevin, and that cashier was a little prick. But I should be feeling something about all that, right? Yeah. So maybe I am crazy. Not, you know, like Steve and Farmer John's girl, but neither was Kevin, and we both know he was crazy, right? Yeah. You know, I think I can live with all that. But are you so sure that you aren't crazy, too? What? What are you talking about? Oh, come on, Jared. You woke up knowing that something was wrong, so you think you're a psychic or a medium or some shit like that. I think you're just paranoid with the good luck to be right. Paranoid? Was that what I was? Crazy, after all? And so crazy that I couldn't even see it? I couldn't deny that all-prevailing, all-encompassing dread and worry was all I had felt since this all started. But it wasn't as if those feelings weren't warranted. Still, Chris had a point. The outright savagery of Steve and the little farmer girl. Kevin's manic laughter, the gun-toting redneck at the gas station, and the cold indifference of Ronnie and Chris himself. Madness comes in many forms, including paranoia. Okay, maybe. So, so what do you want to do about that? Nothing. Paranoia might come in handy. Keeps your mind sharp, like a watchdog. I just don't want you to shoot me for no reason. And will you shoot 
me for no reason? <laughs> if I shoot you, I'm sure I'll have a damn good reason. There's an old pickup outside. I found the keys under the seat. Get your gun. We're wasting daylight. I gathered the box of ammo Chris had found in the car and stuffed them into my pocket. I felt a warm sense of comfort as I wrapped my hand around the cold, wooden grip of the shotgun. Maybe I was crazy, but I was armed, and if I'd counted correctly, Chris was out of bullets. Listening to Madness, Episode 3, House of the Devil, written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. Featured in the cast were Persephone Rose as Jared Carvey, Shane Harris as Chris Larson, Russell Gold as Ronnie Black, Deborah Adams as the little girl, and yours truly as the announcer. Madness is written and created by Andrew T. J. Rowe and was produced by MJ Cogburn. The musical score was performed by Celestial Aeon Project. The executive producer for Darker Projects is MJ Cogburn. This has been a Darker Projects production. Visit us on the web at www.darkerprojects.com. This is Mark Brzee. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Tracy Babian, co-author of the Carlson Chronicles podcast. My husband, J.A. Babian, the main author, had a triple stroke in the latter part of August of this year. Jerry was lifelighted to Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a brain bleed that the doctors thought they were going to have to do surgery on him, which surely would have killed him. Thank the Lord they didn't. He survived that brain bleed and swelling, but he is in need of so much for his recovery I have started a GoFundMe to help with all the costs that I just don't have. I retired back in April of this year so that I could take care of Jerry, as he was starting to show signs then that I just didn't catch. Little did I know this would be a blessing in disguise. He is fighting this setback of memory loss and 75% use of his right leg, arm, along with his cognitive speech. Considering the doctor said he would not make it, I consider him to be a miracle. Medicare has only granted 12 visits of physical and speech therapy twice a week. He needs at least six months worth of speech therapy alone. That is a total of $4,000 we need to pay up front that I just don't have. So far, we have had $775 in donations of the 10000 we need come in. Please donate today so that he can get his needed medication, therapy, and also help pay bills that Medicare just will not cover, even if it's only $5. I update this account so folks can see his progress. You can go to my Facebook account, Tracy Babian VO, to find the pinned link with the title Jerry Babian Stroke Victim Needs. Jerry says, thank you. I still have a lot to write on my stories that I want to get done. Please help me to achieve that goal. Thank you in advance for your donation. Tracy Babian.